Okay, 10 minutes past the time. Um, just a review of, um, of Tom Lang with WKD, which is like considered one of its bigger successes. And, uh, and I just want to go over uh, one, you know, one of the more interesting things about this that at least I got out of it, out of the tunneling. And the tunneling probability is uh, minus, um, God, I forgot what the, it's something, it looks something like that. And again, I'm showing you, I'm using slightly different, I'm not being consistent with my um, expression, but I, what I'm giving you is um, what you find online. Uh, you actually do not find, this stuff is not really in textbooks. It's like um, two, two, uh, e to the minus two. Where this, of course, is the, is the phase integral. Two, two, um, square root of two m e minus v, um, and as it as it applies to this problem, let's call it zero to l. And another thing, I've been horribly consistent. Next time I do this class, I'll make sure I have l's or a's. You know, I kept switching between l's and a's, and um, make sure that that's um, yeah, where um, yeah, I got it right. So, and again, I want to make sure. Uh, so, you know, we do need to have an exam really, really, really soon. And what do you think about, uh, there we go, it picks up an H bar. Um, you know, the difference between momentum and K is that there's an H bar there or not, which is detailed. Um, in class exam or take home? Take home. Take home. Take on, actually, I was kind of hoping you'd lean that way. Right, look, I'm going to ask harder questions. All right, and I want you to get um, Mathematica. What I'll do is I'll just go ahead and tell you. I'll, I'm going to give you a potential surface, and you'll you'll do this. Uh, and I'll send you some Mathematica examples. I meant to do that a long time ago. Uh, okay, so take on. Uh, we we really do have to have one soon. So again, I, you know, my disorganization is horrible. But it's just this is the first class flubs on faculty part. All right. Anyway, anyway, I was talking about this. All right, the deal is wave function two has to equal wave function three at x equals L, just like wave function one has to equal to wave function two. So the name of the game is to relate wave function three to wave function one through wave function two. And the way you do that is, knowing that they're equal at these parts, all you've really got to do is just figure out how wave function two attenuates inside the center. Now, saying that there's no backscatter wave, there's only a forward wave, uh, and remember that things do reflect off anti-potentials. So I call this a potential, it's a wall. This is the disappearance of a wall, but things still reflect off that, which again is kind of cool and wave-like. Uh, recall that uh, the, the reason this is going to work is that at x equals zero, it has to be equal to the wave function one due to continuity, um, but as it traverses from zero to wherever, um, kx. Right, so, so wave function two at zero is equal to this, and, um, God, sorry, I need, I need to think ahead what I'm gonna do. I, I, um, I didn't mess with this bother me. <laughs> this is why I'm going to have to check in the hospital one day. Anyway, okay, so wave function 2 at 0 has got to be wave function 1 of 0 because this, like, this basically this phase factor, that's the proper word for it. Um, and I think there's an I in front of that, right? It's um, a minus I in front of that. Uh, from 0 to 0 is, is 0. So, so this is simply statement of continuity. Um, but when you need to look to see how it travels to, to point L, uh, as we talked about last time, that upper limit turns into an L. Right, so that's how you do this. And then so wave function, uh, and then of course at L, this has got to be equal to wave function three. And so therefore wave function three over wave function one, oh, yeah, which is the percent transmission, 
ends up being wave function zero e to the blah over wave function, right? And then of course you have to square it and the answer is e to the minus two. Two comes from squaring integral zero to L kx. Exactly like we were earlier. Okay, anyway, look, just a trip down memory lane. I always like to kind of remind you a little bit about what we did last time. I know, I, I kind of was looking at some of you, I kind of felt like you're like, wait, 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 what, 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 what? Uh, it helps to, one of the things about quantum I highly recommend is just do it over and over again. One of the reasons I always have videos from PCAM, COVID or no COVID, I had, I've been doing this for a long time because sometimes I just think you just got to see it over and over and over again because it's so weird, right? I mean, when I teach thermo, I like thermo, I like stat net because I think it can always use an analogy. It's like a fish in the stream and then you're like, oh, a fish in the stream, I know exactly what's happening. Like when you try to do a derivative of, of x squared, and then I can kind of throw any derivative at you. Well, it's x cubed. Well, now that you've seen it once, you can do it for just about anything. But that does not get great, but that doesn't happen here. So over and over and over again. Anyway, so we're all right there. I told you what I'm probably going to do on the exam. All right, download Mathematica. And once you get used to um, symbolic, and I'll, I'll send you, well, I sent you a spelling dictionary because I can't spell. There we go. Uh, I will do a couple of examples of math. I'm just learning mathematics for myself. And it's not hard. I mean, I know what integrals are. It's just getting it to do the integral. <laughs> Brackets versus parentheses. That's that's what's killing me. Anyway, okay. Multi-dimensional quantum mechanics. We're going to do. Um, now, this is an undergrad level deal, right? Um, but we're going to do some of the harder problems that we did not touch as undergrads. Um, so, obviously, we did hydrogen atom, and I'm hoping all of you did hydrogen atom. Uh, and regardless, uh, the way energy adds, let's look at the kinetic energy operator. It ends up being stupid. You just add, you just add, you literally are just adding in the kinetic energy from other dimensions. And if you are ever reading any Stephen Hawking stuff, uh, dark energy and all that jazz, uh, here, I guess I better have a wave function. Um, and actually, let me remind you that we always run into separable solutions. So the wave function ends up being um, three functions. And they can be very different. Uh, depends on the potential energy, which would be a function of x, y, and z. And now I'm wishing I hadn't done this because I keep writing the same thing over and over again. There you go. Uh, so, a couple things. Energy is add, so this is obvious. Potential energy is almost always a function of position. It's really rare to see. I, I don't know if you've ever thought about this. But it really matters. It is very consequential that potential energies are, are universally functions of position versus, I don't know, velocity or anything else. It's just not how our universe works. And speaking of stat net, that actually has like profound implications for how um, phase diagrams work, you know, liquid versus gas and all that. It ends up being terribly important, but they, they can look like anything. There are always functions at x, y, and z. All right, now ultimately we can separate these. We've talked about separability before. Uh, act on a wave function on the right and divide it out on the left, and then you get a bunch of miniature Schrodinger equations. So that way, you know, if we're doing a particle in a 2D box, uh, Lx, Ly, the wave function ends up just being over 2 over Lx, over 2 over Ly. Uh, the wave functions multiply, right? So energies, you end up with differential equations where you have terms added, and the wave functions themselves are multiplied. And you can work uh, kind of simple problems. Um, and pi x over L x. Uh, you can uh, try to like calculate the energy. If you if you were to take like well, if you take this wave function where the functions are multiplied and calculate the energy, 
you end up with the energy in x plus the energy in y. Energies add. So everything's fine. If you were to try to say, oh, uh, maybe these, the wave functions are added together, then you actually do not have an eigenvalue equation. And you don't know what the energies are. It, it, it's mathematical junk. So again, um, multi-dimensional problems for like, like undergrad level particle in a box, I mean, they're jokes. Just add these in, and really, I'm just multiplying the thing by itself. I'm just changing x's and y's. It, it's just that stupid. Even at an undergrad level, I only spent about 10 minutes on this. OK, so we're not going to do this. Oh, you're going to love this. How different can that be? Instead of a particle and a square, so of course it, it's a particle, it's combined in a plane, the walls are infinitely potential, in, in, uh, potential energy is infinitely high. Okay, so the particle is in this plane and there's um, a circular potential that's infinitely high. They have the same area. Um, the area is LX, LY, the same area. Same mass, it's an electron. How different can the solutions be, right? Hideously different. They're horribly different. So, so we're going to do that problem. Um, and again, like I say, this is not a, something we do in undergrads um, because because I'm going to do I, I, I do this problem because why was this is unbelievably easy. Okay, so I'm going to have to start uh, when we start working in you know the reason that this is a pain is that we've got to work in spherical coordinates and. Unfortunately, the success here is kinetic energy is it's naturally works in Cartesian coordinates, x, y, and z. And that's because things, when they move, they go in a straight line. But a hydrogen atom has an electron with like a little virtual string on that. And that's actually more meaningful than it sounds, and I'll explain that another day. But the electron is on a virtual string that keeps it going round. Atoms are round. <laughs> So we have to do all of this with, I'm going to start with cylindrical or spherical coordinates. Okay, so we're going to do cylindrical first. So that problem is a cylindrical. And now I have to remember how to spell cylindrical coordinates. That homework problem, is that the one I gave you two yes. as undergrads? Yes. Yeah. Same one? Okay. It is a little bit the yeah, actually, and after your class, I didn't use it anymore. I thought it was just a little overbearing. Um, so anyway, yeah, a little freebie. Uh, but I, I, did you remember how to do all that? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's just like... Ah, okay. Anyway, so look, they haven't been, haven't been in my class a year ago. I, that's a recycled question. But I really want to make sure. There's this thing called, um, maybe you don't write this down, but there's this thing called a Podolsky transform that is a shortcut to what I'm going to do. And that's what I covered in my class in quantum. But it's a trick that I can't, I can't see inside of it. In other words, here's a magic formula that you input all these weird things that don't make sense, but out comes an answer. I don't see the value in that. So in my homework, you know, I'm, I'm kind of giving you the same homeworks I had. My homework was to do a Podolsky transform to cylindrical coordinates. And I looked at this, and I'm like, you know, I don't really understand what this means. I mean, I, I understand it means that it gives me the right answer. But I don't know what it means. So I threw it out. Um, but I do want you to know that when it comes to these kinds of uh, coordinates transforms, this thing exists that while the inputs are, like, I just don't know what they physically mean, the outputs are answers. So that's cool. Anyway, OK, so what we're going to do is, I'm going to be kind of quick about this. Right, we've got to turn double derivative into one uh, cylindrical coordinates, which is just going to be um, uh, r and phi and, um, for, for um, sorry, I'm thinking about it. Uh, for cylindrical, then partial is these, partial is these. Um, oh, sorry, is there the stuff in front of it? No, 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 sorry, 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 no, I'm being an idiot, I'm being an idiot. Um, the change in, sorry, 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 I, I, I didn't write that down right, I just wasn't thinking right. Um, 
So um, the change in x is going to be a change in r, a change in phi, a change in y is going to be the same. Uh, but the change in z is not changed at all because z will be the same. Now, in spherical coordinates, uh, we would have an r, a phi, and a theta as well. And z would also be r, phi, and theta. So this is just a nice warm up. Um, the way that I'm going to do this, by the way, obviously you can do, full, this is cylindrical, if you do spherical, it still works, but instead of like on that homework, it's about two or three pages, and I'm walking through it, it, it really is, I know it looks daunting, but when you start doing it, it's really easy, uh, because I, to be honest, I, I kind of walked you through how to do it. Uh, but if you did actual full-blown full blown spherical, that's got to be like 20 pages, 20 pages of algebra. I'm not, I'm not, I started on doing that just for the hell of it one day, and I was like, yeah, no. I mean, I, I can get, I know I can get it. I don't want to spend a week doing algebra in my office on that. Uh, anyway, okay, so let's do change in x. And again, the, um, it's all your homework, so I'm just, I'm going to be real brief about this. The point here is that one of the things, one of the gu guiding principles that helps me walk my way through a lot of these is that equations have to be the same on left and right. Now, when I'm doing these kind of transformations, especially integral transformations, when I'm changing an integrand, I always remember that everything has to be exactly equal to you know, left and right. So the reason I'm comfortable with is that you can basically strike out the change in O with the strict change in R, and I've got the change with respect to X, right? This is, this is A over A, and I can cancel it out. So that's why I like that. Now, in what is essentially kind of like a product rule, um, you've also got, and I'm going to work these separately, changing the feed. Remember, theta is a, is a deal for um, full blown a 3D spherical, but we're doing 2D cylindrical. Okay, these two. Now, let me um, work each one of these. Uh, the change in r is square root of x squared plus y squared over the change in x. Okay, so now remember that this, this guy, nothing happens to it. It's an operator anyway. Not, nothing should happen to it until it's gotten the wave function to chew on. This is a thing. This is clearly something I can do. Now, let's see. The derivative of a function to the half is going to be uh, it's going to be to the minus a half. Uh, then I just need to take the derivative of the inside. Oh, to the minus a half, right? Uh, did I forget? Uh, uh, now one half raised to the minus a half. I, I wanted to put a minus half in front. Um, yeah, okay, then dpr. Uh, now here's a thing. Okay, so the two's cancel. Uh, Here's something that got people, at least at the undergrad level, when I taught this last. They get here and they stop. The screw up is that this isn't in cylindrical coordinates. X is Cartesian. That is not the purpose. Then you have to remember things like X is R, R cos, I think. R cos, phi. Uh, y is R sine phi. So you end up with cos, cos phi dr. R is canceled. X is R of cos phi, so it's just cos phi dr. Okay. Likewise, this thing, and notice that, be careful with the symmetry I'm working here. I didn't know whether I should do it this way or not, but, um, but this is what I did. Um, you end up, up, up so, Phi is arctan, arctan of y over an x. Anyway, we can look all this up. It's all, it's all on there. And this is a big minus sign. Minus sign phi over r. Okay. Okay. Change in y ends up being um, sine sine phi dr, and again, remember, I'm always looking for these symmetries. Um, sine dr, cosine dr, okay, that makes me comfortable. 
Now this next thing, I'm, I'm wanting to see a plus. Where there's a minus, there, there, there better be a plus. And if there's a sign, there better be a cos. So anyway, I'm always looking for these inversions. Uh, still over R. Okay. So there you go. Again, stupid trick. Really not that hard. Um, it's just painting us. The thing about PCHEM, you know, even advanced quantum mechanics is all mostly algebra. Okay, negative, if you make a single mistake, you just completely screwed it. And if you're programming the space shuttle, you just killed everyone. And that is truly your fault. The positive is, someone has to do it, and if that person's you, you're going to make a ton of money so long as you don't murder anyone. Just avoid murder. That's the main trick. Okay, now, when it comes to the double derivative, uh, now, I look at that and I'm like, oh, wait a minute, how do I do that up here? And the answer is you don't. You just do this. So, um, cos, uh, there's only one angle, so I'm just going to put that in there's the pin is in trouble. Sine. And the reason I like to bring this up, and this is a big part of your homework, is to keep track of your, of your operators. You have to be very conscientious of your operators and the order in which they come. And that's because when we get to uncertainty principles, x change in x is not the same as change in x, x. Those, those will not be the same. So when you have a little, you know, we have a little foil going on here, you got to make sure that this guy is in front of that guy. Right? And that's how to do that, in case you were confused. This comes in front of this. So this first term um, ends up being cos ddr, cos ddr. Now, that will be cosine squared double derivative of r because this cosine um, is not stopped by a chain by this derivative because it doesn't have an r in it. Um, so when it comes to this next term, cosine, that has to stay put. Right? The sine can go through, so let's do that, it's just cos squared dr squared. Okay, let's do this. Minus, uh, the minus can come out, cos sine. Sine can come out, dr, 1 over r, dv. Okay, anyway, and then, then you've got some more terms. Okay, now the answer ends up being. Uh, let me write down the answer, because again, I didn't want to blow the entire, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> You're going to do it on your homework. And again, uh, sometimes people don't, the thing that's a little silly here, I've been guilty of this, sometimes people just don't even include the change in Z, because it, you're, you're really working in the xy plane, um, but I don't want you to, you know, it's an approximation, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do it. So the answer is not particularly mind-blowing. The, the 3D, the 3D kinetic energy operator is pretty hideous. Okay. Now again, forget the EZ. It, who cares? When you when you do this guy and then you add this one in, like on your homework, this kind of garbage is going to go away. Right. So, and you can see this guy, this guy. It, it, this is this is going to ultimately come here. It's because you're going to have a sine squared ddr squared, right? And cosine squared plus sine squared is one. That's that's how they factor away. This guy makes sense. This guy is going to be killed off by somewhere else, probably in here. Anyway, so that's how it goes. Um, and, uh, oh, and the last bit, last bit to point out, and this is fascinating, just don't, there, there are times where you're going to see the Schrodinger equation, the kinetic energy operator, written in ways that are like, what in the heck is that? I'm watching my language. Uh, you, have to, you have to look out for stuff like this. Uh, let's see. Um, Okay, what have I got? Let's look at this thing. Let's look at this thing. All right. 
What about that? Let me, let, me, let me do something like this. Let me write this down for the element. And I'm writing this down because I know the answer. I can tell you this and that are the same thing. They're the exact same thing. Sorry, let me, let me do this in case you wonder what the hell is going on. I, I should have just moved the point down. Anyway, I, the way you figure this out is apply it to something. Something, whatever. Don't make it a sine or a cosine, it's just called a wave function. Okay, what happens? Okay. First step is dr r derivative with respect to r. Okay, what is that? Okay, I've got a product here. Okay, uh, 1 over r, just write that down, don't think about it because otherwise, you know, I'm not going to try to factor it already. Okay, I always like to get rid of that guy first, so take the derivative of r to leave everything else. Okay, now I take the derivative of uh, that thing. Okay, that's that. Um, the double derivative. Double derivative, I'm, um, I'm writing these in a different order. I'm just factoring out the wave function because ddr squared, 1 over r ddr, 1 over r ddr. So this and this are the same. By the way, I think there's like three or four others. <laughs> there's three or four other ways to write this part down, especially when it comes to spherical. And people use one form or the other because the way they solve it is like it's helpful to solve it the way that they chose to solve it for which there are many ways <laughs> depending on how you express them <laughs> so another thing to note when it comes to Schrodinger equation it's always 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 the kinetic energy out there that's always the thing that makes all of this way harder than it should be that's where you've got a differential equation it's always the kinetic energy operator. Right? It's got some partials in it. And now you've got a differential equation. And differential equations suck. I'm supposed to say they're challenging, by the way. I don't know if you picked up on that, but where it's illegal, it's illegal in science to say hard or, or suck that. That's actually for other reasons. But um, <laughs> yeah, I better edit that. I got a lot of stuff to better edit. Um, you're supposed to say challenging. I'm absolutely freaking sick of it. If I hear that word again, I'm going to throw it up. Some things are just hard. Okay, so we're going to do particle on a disk. So we're now back to the land of flat potentials. And of course, outside of our uh, V potential will be in there. So I've kind of gone backwards. I wanted to do WKB which has a curved potential surface. I want to do that because WKB is still almost always applied to just like a single dimension. Um, and so even though the potential is curved, it's still just a thing. And, and you just do it with X, right? Or maybe, maybe X is like a, a radius of a bond. But anyway, so I don't know if I did that in the right order or not, but I had to pick something. Okay, let's see. All right, right down the Schrodinger equation for this. And mass will be, okay, another thing to be very wary of is that there are multiple M's when it comes to uh, atoms which have angular momentum. And you should know that there is another M for angular momentum, which is a subquantum number for the azimuthal, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right, the azimuthal component of the angular wave function, which we're going to run into right now. Um, and I will show you that this is separable. Again, kinetic energy operator. Uh, we're, we're just, we've thrown out Z. Z, you know, is constrained to be in the XY plane, so there is no Z. So we can just get rid of that. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some factoring. Uh, minus h bar squared over 2m. 
So I'm going to bring that over to the side. You usually associate that with energy. And um, then I'm going to divide, divide on the left by uh, this. OK, and what I'm trying to do is approve separability. OK, so okay, these constants are over there, so I can work on this guy. I've got, um, uh, oh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Um, OK, there's another one, sorry, molt. Multiply everything by r squared. I'm doing that because it's going to, because it gives me the answer very quickly. It's like, there's no reason, like, oh, well, of course we do that because a fish goes up the river. No, nothing like that. It's because several steps from now, I'm going to be glad I did it. That's why. And that's why, again, you know, I, I, I really like teaching stat back more than quantum. It's exactly because of that. Okay. So this operator, this wave function of phi has just gone right through this operator, uh, and, I, and I divided these out. Uh, but I was not able to do that with the radial operator, uh, and, I, and I'm assuming separability, but, uh, but the fact that what I'm about to do is going to work is going to prove it. So, okay, so I've separated, so I've got one term without any fees in it. Um, then I've got r squared over r. Uh, remember, I, I've seemingly arbitrarily multiplied by um, r squared. Okay, and now I've got, um, oh, and you see why? You see why? Now there's no r squared. Now I've got uh, 1 over psi of phi, double derivative with respect to phi psi of phi. And of course, e is on the right because I've divided, e is a number and I've divided out the wave functions on the left, but e is a number, so the wave functions are gone. Okay, uh, this is separated. A term with R, a term with R. Wait one second, wait one second, what have I done? No, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Minus H bar squared over 2M R squared E. Sorry, yeah, I told you I need some factors, right? I just forgot about that. Um, yeah, so, okay. A term with R, a term with R, funky about this, a term with R, and then a guy by itself. Um, so um, now what that means is, um, uh, what, what am I, um, uh, that means that this guy, I have to admit, I've gotten myself a little bit flummoxed here uh, about something because um, what have I done? What have I done? What have I done? I feel like I've made I feel like I've made a slight mistake here on my notes. Sorry, I should have double checked this. Um, um, uh, now this this will work. This will work. Um, let's see. So it turns out that this part, okay, so where I'm forming is um, how to prove this. Uh, and, I've, and I've kind of run out of time. I'm not going to figure this out right now. Um, uh, so I've got separate Schrodinger equations. Um, and what I contend is, for reasons that I cannot fully explain right now, although this will work, uh, that this guy is going to be um, e to the e to the i m sub l b. Okay. Now the reason I can do that is um, is that when you plug this into here, you get a constant. Um, therefore, term. The term of phi is constant. Now, I don't know if you recall this, but I, I, I mentioned this a while ago. When you've got separated wave functions where this is a, an r and r, and then here's another r term, and this is a phi term, when you've got all those in the same equation, each one has got to equal a constant. So, uh, and, I, and I think I might have even proved that. 
last time. But it's, it, one reason that it works is that if these differentials, DDRs and DDPs, if each term is not a constant, what that means is that a fluctuation in R is compensated by a fluctuation in phi. So if something stretches, then the angle changes too. Why would that happen? That's like throwing a curveball, and because it decided to spin to the right, it also moved up. Now, a pitcher can do that, but, but that's because it's been set up, right? I mean, it's, it's not going to, that, what I described is magic, without any trickery, because I have a, you know, an MBL pitcher. A ball moving in a straight line, or if, if for some reason it curves one direction this way, there's no reason to think it's going to do anything this way as a result. Um, and as a result, for the same logic, each one of these things is a constant. Okay, now this thing ends up being the exact same thing as um, if you're going to set this equal to a constant, then, um, then you've basically got yourself the exact same Schrodinger equation, the flat potential Schrodinger equation we've been working with the whole time, and you end up with the free wave solution. So there you go. Now, this is obviously rotation, you know, this is the angle. So, since this is an angle, you know that you've got to have things being smooth and continuous. And so, for continuous, you've got this. You know that the wave function at uh, phi has got to be equal to the wave function once it's rotated. It's got to bite its own tail. And again, that's, that's the continuity, that's the continuous boundary condition. It's a little funky. The, the, the bite your tail <laughs> boundary condition. I guess it's somewhat new. Uh, and what that means is that M sub L has got to be a, uh, the only way that this works is that M sub L has to be a whole number. It can be negative, which corresponds to something moving like left-handed. It could be positive, which is corresponding to something moving right-handed, dot, dot, dot. Now, one of the reasons that that is, the way you can prove that this is the case, is I just want to point out that e to the 0 is equal to e to the uh, 2 pi i is equal to e to the 4 pi i is equal to 1. Okay, so in terms of things moving to pi, and there's an i involved, um, you've got to have m sub l being a whole number, or, or this, this is not going to happen. Um, and you can actually prove that by um, making this equal to, this equal to itself, where you've added 2 pi to that. Um, and then e to the 2 pi i, 2, I, two pi i, um, e to the um, i m phi, e to the i m 2 pi, it has to be equal to e to the i m phi, and so therefore this has to be equal to 1. Uh, and based on what I just showed you, that has to be a whole number. So anyway, that's the proof. I just did that off the top of my head. That one's so small. <laughs> anyway, okay. Now what you're left with is, I got three minutes, right? Yeah. yeah well, but also, should that theta be a pi? The 2 pi plus? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Phi ends up being, yeah, no thetas. Theta's only for 3D. I just, I like theta, but phi is like a little bit. So I don't, um, phi ends up like never being important when we go to 3D. Uh, theta is always more important. Also, be wary that uh, mathematicians and versus physicists and chemists. Physicists and chemists define three-dimensional R theta phi differently than mathematicians. Mathematicians, so phi is this, theta is this, to us, and mathematicians define it the other way. Because screw, screw you guys. That's why. That's that's their attitude. That's really stupid. Um, and you have to be careful because. Remember, we steal this stuff from mathematicians. 
And when you're looking up the answers, you may run into a math website that will have this reversed. And you got to be real careful. Like when I was preparing my notes, I had to be real careful with this. Okay. Now let me plug that back into the above, and what you end up with is this. R squared is pen will be thrown out. This is the last day for this pen, which we got one of the so uh, now what I've done here is that wave function of R on the left, I've multiplied it out. Okay, so I've got M sub L, uh, and that's going to be squared because I've taken the double derivative of P. Uh, then I've got the radial wave function plus, now, now I'm going to bring over R squared 2ME over H bar squared. So I'm just bringing over the um, energy term. And I'm doing this because math is, <laughs> I just was bashing mathematicians. Maybe they'll review my grants. Uh, they like to put things this way. They like to set everything equal to zero, and then they, they solve it that way. So when you look up the answer, so back in, seven, I swear to God, 17 something, this seriously was solved in 17 something something, 1783, I think. Um, where did God? Uh, Bessel. So Bessel solved this, and his differential equation is this. Uh, these people, when they figured out about calculus, they just started solving things for the heck of it. Although often what happens is they knew about diffusion and they were like trying to model like the flow of water. And it turns out a lot of what we're doing here is very similar. Uh, very similar to water diffusing. Okay, so Bessel wrote an equation out this way and then solved it. Which is, if, if you feel like doing it, well, I'm not going to do it, all right? I'm just pointing out that um, this equation, R, you know, where, where I've got, um, instead of an alpha, I've got an M sub L. Um, I've got some constants in front of my R, but it, it's all really kind of, those, those are not a big deal. Um, there's a solution to this. Um, these are Bessel, Bessel functions. Um, now this guy, remember that this is related to our M sub L. And it's called, called the order. Okay. Now remember, where I know that you like S, P, and D, right? But remember, for the most part, when you think S, P, and D, you're thinking of three-dimensional solution. And um, that would be the L quantum number. Now we're in reduced dimensionality. So what you are think of as L is now our M sub L. And so this is basically our M sub L. It's our new S, P, and D. So just think of it that way. Now the solution, I'll, I'll write this down and I'll quit, is generally called J of R. And it's um, solved by a method of, God, what's it called? Oh, God, I forgot. Um, there's this real specific mathematical technique. Notice that the answer is not a function. Sorry, it is a function. Everything's a function, uh, but it's not like it's not like e to the minus r, you know. <laughs> and this thing is called a gamma function, which you will see forever and ever to be two m plus gamma. Anyway, so that's Bessel's function. And again, it's, uh, there, there's this like iterative method of solving this thing. Uh, last bit I want to point out that um, if you think about it, if you look at this and say, oh my god, what the hell, think about this. Um, sine, sine is also written as, as a series. This is a series, right? Sine is a series. Um, you can't do a sine in your head. I mean, kind of. I mean, you can do sine of pi in your head. But for the most part, your calculator, when you say sine of 0.3, your calculator is putting that number in a series to X number of terms to give you 12 significant figures. This is no different. 
It's just, you're just, you haven't heard of it before. That this is no different than sine. It's just a decimal function. Sine, sine function, decimal function, whatever. Plug it in, number in your calculator, and it spits out the answer. You gotta be fucked up.